Okay, I think I, I got uh, Mark Richardson on the phone now. Let me make sure this works. Hello, Mark? Yes. Hi, you're on the air. How's it going? Very good. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. You're in uh, New York City, right? That's correct, yes. Awesome. So I call you are the original director of Gold Digger, aka Robot in the Family. That's why I'm calling. This is a movie that was filmed probably about uh around what, nineteen eighty nine? Uh I think we started eighty nine ninety. I can't remember exactly um I kinda remember it as uh, as as ninety, but um Okay. Could have started. I was still in film school in '89. I was. Uh, I know when I started the um, the fun process of uh, Gold Digger. I was finishing up my thesis film at NYU. Oh, okay. And um, hadn't quite finished that, and um, which was fun because as the um, as we were making the film, uh, we had the the thesis film was selected. It eventually won uh, first place in this big national student film competition. What was the name of that film? It was called Stray Dogs. Stray Dogs. And um, Yeah, Stray Dogs. And, um, and I remember the... Um, I think we were in production. I had to fly out to the award ceremony and... I hadn't slept in, you know, the, a month because of the, the filming of Gold Digger. Um, I kind of slept walk through the whole thing, but it was uh, it was a nice little highlight because at the time um, it was a uh, Spielberg and Nissan Motors sponsored this competition called wow. Focus Awards, and uh, first place was a free car. So I got keys to a uh, a lovely little Nissan Sentra. That's awesome. Where, where was he? Uh, was that in Los Angeles? The award ceremony. Yeah. Cool. So you drive that car back to New York, or yeah, in New York. Yeah. After, um, you know, I just got the uh, ceremonial keys. Right. Right. Okay. So you were working on the your uh, finishing up your student film, and then you got involved with uh, Gold Digger. Was that the was that the original title of the movie? That was the original title of the movie. I mean, I met Jack Shaul through, um, oh boy, through film school. I was bartending at this restaurant, and, and my co-bartender you know, was one of those, hey, I know a guy who wants to make a movie. And I had been there, done that before. I wasn't too keen on the idea, but... but over a long process of meeting Jack Shaul, who is the most <laughs> um, entertaining, charming guy. Yeah. Um, we, we and I understand you've already you you've already uh, we spoke to him yeah on the radio uh, about uh, about a month or so ago in de- beginning of December he was on on air for an interview and he's very um, excitable. He's got a lot of energy. Oh yeah. Very funny oh, guest. Yeah. yeah, he was he was great. I mean, there's a, there's a, an article that I wrote for uh, Premier Magazine after everything um, was done with the movie. Um, one of the one of the writers for Premier Magazine, who had covered a couple of my films, actually uh, saw this article in um, like Fortune Magazine on the cover of uh, insurance fraud and and um and it was a story about jack right yeah i've pulled up a, a link to this article um uh, it seems it's pretty uh outrageous this whole story that goes on in here you, you, you sit- everything about gold digger everything about the making of that movie was outrageous yeah well it's, and it's an outrageous film it was a weird f- when my friend brought it over he we were uh out you know vhs hunting and he picked up this movie and it was, it's the title we have is uh, that I have is Robot in the Family and it's a uh, VHS released by Apex and the whole thing's marketed towards kids. It says family adventure comedy. But the thing that struck that stuck out is when he pulled it out of the actual box. It said it was rated R, 
And so my friend decided to buy it because he thought that was a very odd thing it that is. this it family is. movie is. I mean, <laughs> I haven't seen the whole version of uh, Robot and the Family. Yeah. So basically what happened is when we finished making Gold Digger, it's a completely different movie. When we finished making Gold Digger, we took it out to L.A. and we did our screenings and we had offers, but they weren't big enough. Um, um, they, they were not big, massive offers like, like Jack was uh, hoping for. Right. So I was promptly fired and kind of that was the end of my involvement with, uh, with Gold Digger. And then um, time went by and I guess he decided to uh, redo the whole movie right as a as a family it was originally not so family oriented so the well, version it was always when we <clears throat> when we started the process um and it's in that article that i wrote and I, when i first met jack he he gave me this uh, bible size screenplay um, that he dictated his stories. Now, you gotta love the guy, but but he <laughs> he um, the original story was about eight hundred pages of <laughs> just wackiness. Yeah, and a lot of it is mean spirited wackiness. <laughs> and to him, it just he could make fun of. Uh, he was very democratic, and he just ripped into everybody. This yeah, it goes of, after. Uh, it's it, 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 Equal opportunity offender. This film. It's like uh, stereotypes of every race getting zapped by a malfunctioning robot. It's uh, it's great. And I love it. He as a as a character. You know, Jack is a um, Jewish Iranian. Yeah. Immigrant, and you know his story. If you believe him, is he came over here with nothing, and he made um, he made his millions. He lost his millions. He made them. He lost them. He you know. <laughs> He is the um, he is quite a um, colorful character, and, and what he his passion he really wanted to make movies. Right. Yeah. He was so um, after a long dating uh, period of where, where I um, I really didn't want to do it, and and what I when I was convinced that he both had the money and really wanted to do it. And I said about saying, okay, I can't direct this thing. Is not to, if you saw Straight Dogs and my other work, I, I'm I'm a kind of um, uh, much more you know, say dark, but um, I go for drama, right? Comedy and wacky comedy just isn't something that it's not my world that much, but. For inspiration, and so what I told him is, I'll, I'll produce this for you. I'll find you another director from NYU, and and we we interviewed some colleagues of mine, and um, but nobody could really get along with um, Jack, or Jack didn't get along with it. Everybody wanted to try to make it something that Jack didn't want, right? Um, Story wise, because we had to distill this. Of, uh, of this, uh, this um, 800-page concept that had no story in it. Uh, it just had uh, uh, had these wacky little moments with the family. Was there a lot of robot in the original ending. screenplay? No, there was no robot. Oh, there was no robot. The, the whole thing is he was an invent an inventor, but he never invented anything. <laughs> So, so the ro- so the robot got added in somewhere during when you were distilling the the mammoth screenplay. Yeah, we started with uh, let's give him a little robot invention, a cute little you know we we pictured pictured it as a kind of a C three PO or something, some mm-hmm. little thing that um, tagged along and you know could be useful and funny when when we needed it. Um, and 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 Jack went out and. and built gold digger is um it's an impressive robot it really is <laughs> <laughs> it is it's very impressive you know when when he first unveiled it it was like holy smokes <laughs> that's not what we had in mind yeah but um 
but eventually, um, after a long process of um, creating a script, and I was kind of, I mean, at my helm, I was trying to create something along the lines of Goonies. Right. An action-adventure film um, that that uh, visually was really fun and exciting, but but um, it wasn't slapstick. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, uh, Joe Pantoliano yeah, was is also in. Um, I remember being impressed by Goonies from. When I yeah, he's one of the villains in that. Thought. He's one of the villains and in, in, in a fun, you know, fun, lovable villain. Mm-hmm. Like that. Um, so that was going to be the, um, and I showed that to Jack, and I, and I, um, you know, I said, "This I can, I can do this." Okay. I mean, not as good as Goonies, I, I have, right? Have that kind of, uh, but um, but we can make a, a, you know, it'll be off the wall just because of the world that we're living in this Iranian antique dealers and nefarious scams and all kinds of um, all kinds of stuff I remember the original when I originally read his script after about 90 pages we had we were still at home in the first scene <laughs> um, Nothing had happened. <laughs> so little by little, we, we, you know, I devised a story that um, that uh, would take us through all this wacky world that that um, in real life Jack is very familiar with. I mean, yeah, uh, he had uh, he had uh, real estate that um, he owned, and in the real estate, in, in some of his buildings were these Chinese massage par- parlors and. <laughs> Um, he, he, you know, he he hated and loved his his enemies, other antique dealers, and <laughs> nothing was ever subtle with Jack. Right, I was pretty amazed looking it up. How much of it seems to be true to life? Like a lot of the characters seem based on real well, people. And and then when the yeah, and and the uh, I hadn't seen the article. I did. I I I got phone calls from the FBI, and I got phone calls from Jack in prison, and. After, um, you know, a little bit down the road, and, and I was like, I don't want to be involved in any of this. And, and that was all after it, you had it, fin- completed it, the movie? Like uh, This was all afterwards. Yeah. After the movie, after they remade their movie, there was, uh, I don't remember any of the details. but Yeah, Jack mentioned some stuff about gangsters coming into his store. It was a little confusing when he was telling um, it, but... Yeah, they took his movie away from him, Basically, he said. Basically, my understanding is that all of the crimes that we were lampooning in the movie, in my movie yeah. version of Gold Digger, um, kind of came true to Jack. I mean, Right, selling these uh, forged forged paintings and forged statues and stuff. which is. Yeah, I think it started with, um, bless his heart, I think it started with there was a, uh, a painting that... Um, he was trying to collect insurance on because it got damaged by water. Okay. Um, and when the uh, when they investigated, it turned out it was a fraudulent painting to begin with. So we're talking, from my understanding, it was a, a very large sum of money that we were looking for, probably about the amount that he <laughs> that, uh, that the movie cost. Right. Yeah, he said he had to sell buildings to finance this movie. That it cost him every cost him the shirt off his back. Basically, that's what he was saying. Um, getting yeah, back to the and, oh, go ahead. I mean, it was some. Uh, you know, it was a, it was a real budget, and we. Um, I mean, I was. Um, I haven't seen the movie in a long time, and I you know love for your audience to somehow see the original Gold Digger. I believe the only version that's out there is the Robot in the Family version. As far as I could tell, I've looked and looked found, and tried to find the gold I digger. I have a copy. Yeah, I'll make you a copy. I'll make you a DVD. I would love that. I would love to see the original version. <laughs> I would be ecstatic. It's, um, it's um, like I say, it's a completely different, a completely different movie. Right, it's a long, longer version, too. I was too. watching a clip on, um, I, I was Googling this morning and watching a clip of, uh, of Robot and the Family and 
even the robot, like the voice of the robot. Back then, I had uh, he was a much quieter, <laughs> uh, but funny, dry. Yeah. Um, I got Tony Tony Randall, the the Odd Couple. Um, oh, he was the original voice. I got Tony Randall to do the original voice. That's uh, so. I asked Jack who the original voice was, and he said it was somebody from the Honeymooners. I think he was trying to say Jackie Gleason. Yeah, but, he, he couldn't remember. Yeah, he couldn't really remember. Yeah. But the the voice in the version I saw is very Jewish. It's a very Jewish robot, like uh, over the top Jewish yeah, voice for for the robot yeah, in the family really version. A, uh, and it never stops talking. Rating. Yeah, that's some people's uh, biggest problem with the film. Well, I think what happened is, look, they. You got a movie that's about a robot, and the robot never was supposed to be that big of a character. Yeah, the central. Built such a big robot, and um, so okay, we got to get. And he couldn't do anything. I mean, the robot, you know, was a body suit. Inside <laughs> the robot is a is a guy that could barely breathe. Like yeah, this, it oh. sounds like a pretty dangerous. I saw four four credited robots in the cast list, so yeah, it seems pretty dangerous. <laughs> He said, I think Jack said there's something like 2,500 lights going on that, going, going uh, around yeah. there. Yeah. And he could never get the lights, you know. And to him, he would be, we'd be shooting something and he'd be all flipped out because the lights weren't working correctly. You know? yeah. yeah. If only the lights worked better. <laughs> how did, how did you get um, Joe Pantaleona involved in the film? Because he's, I mean, he's a pretty established actor. We had, I mean, you look at the, when you look at the film credits, I, uh, we had an amazing cast. I hired a guy, Jeff Passaro, who's a casting uh, uh, director out in L.A. and a, and a um, theater producer, lovely. Um, and he moved into, uh, we had the advantage of, Jack had his antique shop. Mm-hmm. Uh, he owned the building, so first floor was the antique shop. Second floor was just a... a massive empty space that was um uh, and we moved our production in there and then so pretty much we brought in i can't remember how i found uh, jeff but he started auditioning all the great talent in new york okay that was available and um um yeah, and it was it was it was wonderful. Everybody, every uh, Scorsese actor, you know, the supporting actors of, uh, they're all coming in, and <laughs> they all want to be part of uh, of this wacky zany movie. It's, it's, it is uh, really an uh, awesome cast, and um, J- um, Jack mentioned that Joe Pantoliano lived with him for a while during the shooting of this film, and I see that he's credited as an associate producer. So he must. So other people must have been he, gotten passionate about this movie as it as the filming commenced. It was a, you know, it, it, uh, everybody that was involved with it, it was a pretty impressive time. The making of the movie and, the, and, and everything around it was, um, it was a wonder, it was a wonderful time. The, 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 the not selling and not reaping the rewards that were expected. Yeah. Um, were unfortunate. And that That's when things to, turned uh, sour. That's what Jack, Jack said it was a nightmare. A he said, the, yeah. He said it was a nightmare after the production was I over. Mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, which is unfortunate because we, we um, from what it originally was, which is zany and wacky, and, um, but it wasn't mean spirited and. Um, well, I mean, I, I guess he made the effort after our original after our original screenings out in L.A. Um, you know, the decision to try to turn it into a kids' film when it never was a kids' film. Right, and there's some pretty dark stuff R-rated, left in there. R-rated. Yeah. Um, it's his idea of a kids' film was was. Um, you know, a bit off. Right. There's a scene in, in the version I have where the robot starts it's making the kids a pizza or something and starts putting Drano in their food, which is pretty dark for a kid's film. Yeah, and, I didn't uh, see that. And, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, um, yeah, a, a blind man gets hit by a bus at some point. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people getting z- zapped. Uh, yeah, there's some, some dark stuff. All of that, yeah, all of that was added um, in the next version of it. 
I mean, we certainly had our zaniness, and, mm-hmm. and uh, but it was it was um, it wasn't mean, and right. it wasn't. Um, I remember in, in, the, in just reading the script, you know, around page 300, we're finally away from the house. <laughs> um, Jack is leading a bunch of um, Hasidic Jews around New York, chasing them around. They're all, I mean, it, it was so offensive. <laughs> yeah. and like I say, democratically so that he offended everybody. He just did. Uh, nobody was off limits to him. Right, and you can see that in the yeah, finished he's version. He's such a lovable guy. You know, he just thinks it's funny. It's funny. Yeah. Well, it is. It's so, uh, it's on PC, uh, and comedies nowadays are so safe that I was really, uh, you know, a little bit shocked and just laughing very hard when I saw when I saw a Robot in the Family because it is it is so unlike the movies that come out nowadays. It's a brand of comedy that's kind of gone out of style, I guess. That uh, on PC. Oh, definitely. <laughs> In, in a world of its own, I think. Right, it is. It's and like a right bizarre that, universe uh, that, that it just came from. It's finding an audience. Yeah, I think this movie deserves uh, okay. an audience. I mean, it deserves to be seen in its original form. I'm hoping that a DVD well, will eventually... I, I certainly you know. think it does, but I don't know. I'll send you a DVD. Maybe you'll, you know, you'll, you'll look at it and, and decide that... Um, it uh, it's better with all the uh, <laughs> all the new additions. <laughs> I was watching somebody's um, did a video review of the movie. Yeah, she obviously didn't like it and really tore it apart. Yeah, but uh, as I was watching the original, I was skimming through it um, last night to just you know it's been a long time. Um, there's some wonderful, wonderful moments. And I remember, <laughs> I remember when I was finishing the film, um, when I was finishing the film, it was, um, where am I at? I, I had finished my thesis film, like I mentioned. Um, but I wasn't quite out of school yet. I was doing a workshop. The school had come to me and said, uh, um, this is a graduate department at NYU. And, and, 90, yeah, or 90, whatever that date is. And um, the head of the school said, look, we, we, I've talked Martin Scorsese into doing a workshop, and we're going to hand pick a couple of, uh, you know, he'll take on a small number of, of the students, and you just got to promise me that, you know, if we pick you, that you'll be there, you know, and show up. Right. <laughs> like, are you kidding? Absolutely. So anyway, long story short, that... Um, Scorsese, uh, and he was very helpful on my thesis film, and and um, and so when I'm finishing Gold Digger, I, I I asked him, "Will you watch this film for with me?" Yeah. Um, or you know, will you will you watch a rough cut? So I remember that he gets the Universal or somebody a massive theater in Midtown, and totally empty theater. Just him, me, and my editor. Three of us are in, sitting there, and uh, this is the rough cut. So all the special effects aren't in the sound effects, the design, right. and all that. It's just the rough cut of the picture. And he's twitching through the whole thing. <laughs> 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 he was a good sport. He, he sat there, and um, he laughed at um, you know at a couple of good places where I was in, and. and um, and at the end of it, he goes, well, okay, so you just wasted a year of your life. And, uh, um, if you want, I can call some people at Disney for you. <laughs> no, that's not what kind of movies I, I want to make. I want to make, you know, the kind that you make. Right. But, um, and then I found out that that was the exact same line that he had um, apprenticed under John Cassavetes. Yeah, and uh, Casav- he had shown Casavetes a film. Um, I guess his first film, Boxcar Bertha. Right. And uh, Casavetes said, "Okay, you just wasted a year of your life. Now what are you going to do?" <laughs> so, was that the end of your relationship with anyway. Scorsese, or did you did you keep in contact with him after oh, that? Oh, it petered out. You, there, there was. Um, I had been developing a script that uh, never got made called Live Bait, which was a humorous, noirish, um, uh, con artist down in the swampy Florida where I'm from originally. Yeah. He was, 
he was making noise about maybe he, he hadn't started producing other films yet and, and he talked to me about that maybe he would get involved it never quite worked out unfortunately right and um and then i got in um and i was out in la i think we were trying to make something happen with the uh, gold digger film and his office had called me and invited me to um he was doing a special screening advantage just uh, among you know his close circle of temp- the last temptation of christ oh right right and, you know he wanted i was being invited and i was like oh i'm out i couldn't afford to get back at the time right and um so i think he um didn't take kindly that i turned him down like that but He's lovely. He's a wonderful, wonderful and, and very inspirational. But that moment of sitting there in a dark theater with just him uh, <laughs> and watching Gold Digger. Yeah. Was, well, the movie, I don't know. It's, uh, it needs, I, I'm sure, without the special effects, those, those add a lot to it. All the, the robot, the shocking effects and stuff of people makes it, make it probably an unfair sort of a way to context to see the film. But, um,. You know, it didn't. It, at the end of the day, when I asked him um, during this thing, should I, you know, the, what's his opinion of whether I should get involved in? You know, it's not the kind of movie that I would want to make, but it's an opportunity. And you know, his his approach was, if you can, if you're going to get something out of it, if it's going to make you a better filmmaker, and and um, um, if you can make it better than than you know, if you're passionate about doing it because it was going to be a, a massive investment of time uh, what was so the decision to ultimately make the movie um, came down to this is a wonderful opportunity to work with all these great actors yeah um, I think there was like 70 speaking roles I mean it's a huge cast Right. Um, as you, you know, see from the original, I don't know how much is, is in there. In the, in the, obviously, a lot's come out to replace all the, all the wacky footage. With, right. Back in the- it, is, it is a little chopped up and hard to tell what's going on sometimes. There's some odd, co- like uh, at one point, towards the end, the robot comes in where the, the villain has the father and son like dangling above some gold. The robot barges in and they're like, oh no, the rope, you know gold diggers here and then they cut away to uh, a guy in a van and when they cut back the robots all of a sudden you know just chained up too and there's just like uh, some cuts like that they're like well what just happened in between there the the robot was just kind of come in and save the day how so uh, you know I've, you can tell like there's and there's some like overdubbed dialogue and stuff to try to keep explaining the plot i think right. uh, like at one point the father says oh how am well, i ever going to raise a million dollars uh... but uh they don't explain why he needs to but it's, it's great. It sort of adds to it. I, to the original. Yeah, I'd like to see both both versions released, you know, maybe a double disc or a two-sided disc uh, DVD with the that would be orig- fun. original cut and the uh, the the Disney version, yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, I think Jack would be into that because, if, you know, it's, a, it's another marketing um, opportunity there for him. Yeah. Is... Um, is put out the uh, what the what the movie was supposed to be, and then and then there's his version of it. Right. Yeah. He was very adamant about trying to get. He was talking about you know how he's trying to sell this to Disney, and uh, how they told him they they loved it, but then they ripped off his ideas. I guess for Honey, I Blew Up the Kids, or so. That's what he claims. They stole his uh, solar car for that film. <laughs> he's pretty. Yeah, he, he's, everybody was always ripping him off. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the the solar car like in the movie doesn't doesn't name out there. yeah. He was very uh very into this solar car, but it doesn't serve too much purpose in the movie. I guess it's mentioned a few times. Well, that was the pr- shown, yeah, that but- was part of the um, he was into because he there was a guy in his shop that um, he had a bunch of freeloaders hanging out <laughs> that that uh, one guy was inventing a solar car that worked off of water. Right. Uh, I mean, go figure, but. The guy couldn't speak English very well, but, but so okay, let's put a solar car in the, into the story. <laughs> Ultimately, it was 
a story about this guy that's an antique dealer who is really an inventor mm -hmm. at heart. Um, so we tried to put in these wacky inventions, off-the-wall wacky inventions that never work out, like the car, um, you know, and a wife that's sticking by him but sure wishes he'd get his act together. And yeah. He creates the, he creates the gold the, the the robot that doesn't really work out, but ultimately manages to save the day, save the family, and get the big reward, and and everything is good at the end. Yeah, and then the the version I've seen, you could tell there's more stuff about middle Middle East, about a war in the Middle East, but most of it seems cut out. But occasionally the villain will say something like, "Now there will never be peace in the Middle East," and it's just like, where'd that come from? But then in the credits, it's like. There's battlefield scenes in the credits, which are never never shown in the version I have. Not in there. Uh, that was one of my favorite things. The, um, and, and I was very proud of this because, you know, back then, nobody knew anything. We were all, I couldn't tell a, a, a Sunni from a Shiite and, and, and didn't know anything about what's going on over there. So to, <laughs> to um, show that for the audience... What we do is we have John Reese Davies is playing uh, Eli, the big bad guy, right? And um, and he's selling arms to, um, <laughs> among other things, he's selling uh, arms to both the Shiites and the Sunnis separately. Yeah. So and and just to have fun with it, we 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 went down to South Jersey, where just this empty beach that just looks like sand dunes and. Uh, hired a couple of camels, and we built these fantastic, <laughs> wonderful sets of um, with all these explosions going on. And we have this <laughs> phone call between Eli sitting there in New York, talking first to the uh, Sunni commander and then the the Shia commander. Um, and I had him play both of them. Oh yeah, the idea that we can't tell anybody apart, so let's just make them all. Uh, uh, they're all John Reese Davies. I saw him credited as uh, multiple uh, characters in the cast, but uh, yeah, in the version I have, he only plays the one character. So I was wondering about that. That's great. He does a he does a great job in the movie. Well, well they're, and they're negotiating. You know, I want I want my where are my guns and the other yeah. guys where are my missiles? And, yeah. and he's just sitting back having fun, going all in good time, all in good time. Right, right. It was it was wonderfully wacky, and. Um, and fun. I'm sorry, it's not in the um, in the robot version. Right, my version. Uh, the version I have is only about. It says it's 92 minutes, but I think it runs about 85. This uh, company that released it, Apex Entertainment. I've I've, I've bought a couple more copies, and uh, it's, it's it's odd. It's just uh, the packaging is a little bit flimsy. I guess it's a little inconsistent. Running times are inconsistent from tape to tape, but it's the same. Same movie on every one. <laughs> and the quality varies. Some of it's used with very thin tape that uh, you have to press tracking all the time. But It's part of the uh, experience. And uh, when you were looking for movies, it's, I don't know, I've always hoped I'd find something like, you know, I was, I'm always very excited to find something that just seems beamed down from another universe. And I, I've enjoyed it, uh, you know, several times. I would just love to see to see it released on DVD and to, to see this the other version that's never been seen by... Anybody except you and Scorsese and uh, a few distributors, I guess. It, that's true. It, it, um, very few people have ever seen seen the original. What did and, you? Um, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was. Uh, it would be. Um, it'd be fun to. It'd be great to see them side by side. Do you still have? Uh, do you have? You said. I think you said you had it on like two inch tape or something. The, uh, I have it on two-inch tape. I had a friend at uh, Showtime at the, when I was finishing the film who um, made me, a, uh, at the time, that was the, he just sent it off to upstairs, whatever, and mm -hmm. came back with a, with, a, with a copy of it on two-inch tape. So I've got that. Um, you still have the reels of film? Have, or uh... No, 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 no. I don't own any. I mean, all that. I was, I was like I say, promptly fired because right. I didn't uh, I didn't get a 10 million dollar Disney deal <laughs> after our first screening the expectations were um, a, a little daunting to say the least 
but um, so <laughs> he um, he would have. Uh, I mean, if if it still exists, he would have. Yeah, that would all be in. I think yeah, Jack said he has it, but he he said he has um lots and lots of f- footage. He said he has hours and hours of footage. So I could, he said he has like at least three versions of the film too. I think is what he told me on the radio. But um, well, I'm sure after the original Gold Digger screenings and his um, and it didn't sell for you know any, anywhere close to what he had expected um, I think they he came back uh, I know one of the writers we had brought in a writer can't remember his name who'd been uh, punching up joke lines and all a really nice guy and, you know, I think they they you know just went about trying to figure out what how can they make it zanier and and, and wackier and, and which is what Jack originally wanted right um, right, and you and Jack are both credited as directors, so you can sort of tell you know, the Zanier stuff is. My name is still. Yeah. My name is still there. My wife. Your my name wife is there. Nancy yeah. um, um, produced the original movie. She was. She and I were in out of film school, and um, I see that on the credits of the of the box at least. It, He's been removed. Huh. Yeah, he mentioned he mentioned her during the interview that she produced it. But yeah, I remember him saying that you you and her had teamed up. It to It was a uh, a magical little time back then, especially in the scope of it's a big movie for an independent film. It's a it's a um, it's everything you shouldn't do with a, <laughs> in, with you know if you're going out to make a. Um, self-financed independent film. You don't want a cast of 70 right. characters. You don't want you know, 100 locations that, are, <laughs> you know, that barely ever get reused. It's, it's like we broke all the, uh, all the elements of filmmaking 101 by making <laughs> this kind of epic New York, seedy underworld, <laughs> um, and and using just vast locations and vast. Every scene had new actors that, you know, even just for for one line or or <laughs> just, um, loved it. Yeah, um, have you kept in contact with anybody involved in the movie since since then? I haven't. I, I um, would hang out with John Reese davies in the early years after uh, the making of the movie when I went out to L.A. Mm-hmm. Um, but I kind of stopped. You know, I switched my focus to trying to make some money after that, so I opened up a company here in New York that's uh, more commercial-based. So that's what you've been doing ever since? Ever since uh, Gold Digger, pretty much. Well, I may, I went out and I got the uh, the Jack Shaul bug, and I'm and um, about ten years ago made a um, made my own independent um, feature film, sticking to what I was talking about earlier. That uh, this one was only a couple of locations, only a couple of yeah. Um, and yeah, I hit a wall with the with with distribution in the in the same way. I didn't have any money to market the film. Right. And it got into a bunch of festivals, and 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 then it kind of petered out. And I was so broke, I just um, focused instead on where I seem to have a a, a better shot is is in the commercial world. Yeah. Well, it's it's hard. Um, it's the market's so like oversaturated. There's just so many movies and so many independent movies and stuff coming out now that I guess the distribution part is. You know, the truth is, the making thing. a movie is actually quite easy. Um, I mean, I do it all the time. I, I have I have clients. I make these movies that are actually screened in theaters, but they're but the audience are doctors. This pharmaceutical companies will have me make dramatic uh, half hour movies on on. on uh, schizophrenia or bipolar disease huh. and, 
and um, and there are lovely emotional uh, dramas. Um, making a movie is easy; just getting you know you get good talent, and and that's. 90% of your battle. Right, that's a, that's a Robert Altman quote, I think, too. He said 90% of the picture was casting, and then after that it just kind of makes itself. Yeah, for him, I, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Marketing a movie, selling a movie, the whole, the PR, press, um, and all that, that's a world that I just, I never succeeded at. I didn't really have the heart and spirit, and it doesn't interest me. Right. And I think I, I paid a price for that. I mean, if you're going to take resources, your own, others, uh, and you're going to make a movie, because movies aren't cheap. There's, it's, in a very, it's a very expensive medium, and if you're going to make a movie, then you got to, um, you've got to be in, involved or, or bring in a team that's going to help sell the movie, because the, the making of the movie part is really not that, especially with today's uh, the the equipment, the digital world, and everything. It's not. You do the good good casting, you have a good story, and anyone could go out and make, and make a, a a movie, whether it's any good or not, it will be a whole different thing. But but selling it, that's a whole other world. Right. Yeah, that's the part I never think about. You know, a lot of a lot. I, I was I graduated from film school here in Cleveland and. You know, every you don't you just don't learn about that part, I guess. And you're just young film students aren't really interested in it. It's just like yeah, you got to get this movie made, and then the whole world afterwards is just where movies uh, usually yeah, get lost in the gotta shuffle. Be, you got to be, or or um, it's going to be just another gold digger or in the <laughs> eye of the storm, which was my feature. It's just uh, you know, there's some good, great movies out there that just. Um, don't find distribution. Right. Jack was mentioning how all his so kids are now, all his children are now involved in like trying to make movies, and his son's been trying to get a movie out there, like uh, the film that he completed like five years ago. He's been trying to get it finished and seen. So, uh, but yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. I, I hope that uh, Gold Digger does get discovered because finding that at you know a thrift store out here it was uh, it's a, it's a great thrill for me watching the movie, and I'd really love to see. Maybe you and Jack could uh, reunite and do a commentary track or something. That would be. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. Is he out of jail now? <laughs> uh, he, I don't think he called from prison. No, <laughs> I think uh, I think he was in his. An- I, 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 I tracked him down at his antique store because searching for the movie, I couldn't really find anything about the movie. You know, like even IMDb didn't have like a single actual review of the film. A couple of people had seen it. You know, those real sarcastic reviews. Uh, uh, Ooh, so vicious. yeah, vicious. I know ten stars, best movie ever made. I just you know all that, but uh, I, yeah, that's irony everywhere you go. But um, look when I started when I looked up, I saw the Shaul name in the credits, you know, multiple times. So when I typed him in, that's when I started uncovering this whole your article and the whole like uh, underworld of a uh, gold digger, the whole true story behind the movie it's fascinating i think a, a documentary about the making of this movie would be just as interesting well a lot of people have said yeah uh, after my article came out it's like well this should be the movie yeah exactly <laughs> the making of it was just um it's just so unbelievable um, in 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 um in such a um it's like just another world. Right. Jack, walking into Jack's world at Universe Antiques was like walking into, um, you know, planet Mars. <laughs> I'd, love to, I'd love to go to that store. That's where, I, that's where he called from the interview from. So Universe Antiques still exists, and I can only hope it's just as, uh, just as well, mad. It's not where it was. I think he moved across the street. I avoid that area. <laughs> <laughs> be quite honest but um uh i do believe that he still has a uh, there's still a universe and uh, right that's and, and, and he's probably still do, you know he's probably scheming and uh, <laughs> um, he always had a lot of stuff going on right he's yeah a lovable guy i mean there was the big 
decision in making the movie where Jack wanted to play the lead character. Um, I was uh, very much opposed to that um, because we were getting interest from all these. Our idea was we're gonna we're gonna fill this film up with name actors and it's gonna help the sale of the film. Yeah. Ultimately, um, I had big struggles with um, with with Joey, who you know I loved him. I just was was uh, so passionate about uh, and excited to be working with with uh, Joe Pantoliano, but he he. He didn't have the, uh, and we would have these arguments all the time. Of I wanted him to be more um, jovial and and loving spirit, like the real Jack Shaul, who yeah. is a bubbling um, maniac. <laughs> and Joey said, "But well, but look at my character. I'm a million and a half in debt. I've got all this stuff." Is yeah, he plays it pretty he, downtrodden. Yeah, he plays it very down. Yeah. And um, but but that, that aside, um, I had Jack do a screen test. We put him on film, and you know he's absolutely awful <laughs> um, in his screen test. And we showed it to him, and you know, he kind of accepted it. At that point, I said, "I'll, I'll um, you know." But I did recognize he, he's he's awful as far as if you give him a script and you put him on film and you you know act. He doesn't know what to do. Yeah. If you just wind him up and let him go, he's <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> so after the screen test, I said, Jack, you, you, know, you just you can't carry this movie. But why don't I write? Uh, I'll write your your character in, and and that's and that's where he came into it. Is that uh, went back and I I gave the main character a brother, right? Um, and I don't know how it comes off in the it's, version of uh, Robot and the Family, but it's a bit confusing. Yeah, I'm sure it his is. character only his character shows up about and, twice and in the movie for two scenes, but they should have been he should have been the lead uh, the lead role. He's wonderfully, you know, wonderful presence comes off in just his his love of. Uh, you know, he's goofy and he's nutty and he, and he just um, uh, doesn't have a care in the world. Right. The version I've seen is the Jack, the Oscar character has two scenes, I think. One one where he falls into a sewer and gets hit by a car while, while covered in excrement and another one where uh, he's in a van when he's in the van at the end reading a comic book or something. But they don't really explain that they're brothers. Or I, a lot of the movie is, is muddled. It adds to adds to the charm, though. <laughs> <laughs> the whole confusing experience, especially if you watch it, you know, late at night and not entirely sober. Uh, it might, might be imagine. the way the movie was meant to be seen. <laughs> um, I can imagine. Yeah. Now, what we did is we wrote him in as a, uh, you know, a recent immigrant, the brother um, who doesn't speak any English and. Um, um, he lives at the antique store, and he and he's kind of the handyman, um, <laughs> and he and he keeps getting you know in the scenes that he's in, he gets into all kinds of um, trouble, like the manhole. Yeah, he, right. From the original. Yeah, yeah. Waiting in the van, I think, is also that's parked outside the big foundry where mm-hmm, where the end of the movie, the climax, I guess, takes where the place. The end of the movie, the big finale. Yeah, um, and I can't remember what other scenes, but he's always futzing with the samovar, trying to get the tea right. And yeah, there's a scene of him eating an apple. Oh, yeah, right. so we got him in, uh, and just and just um, just wouldn't let him do the lead the lead role. Right. But yeah, it is it is a excellent cast, and I think that's oh, another reason the movie should be re- that there would I think be interest in this movie is because of the cast. People would I think be ve- there's a lot of Joe Joe Pantoliano. He's you know his career really um, took off. I mean it was it was good before the movie, but after the Sopranos and uh, Matrix and stuff, there's a lot of interest in that. And uh, John Rhys Davies after Lord of the Rings and stuff, there's probably a lot of interest in these actors now, and uh, I think a lot of people would be interested in seeing it. 
a lot of it, you know, because of the cast. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, the cast is is great, and you know, for me, it all went back to you know the kind of my um, again my my tendencies um, to make these dark, dramatic uh, Casavetti's like movies that nobody wants to see. Right. But um, but, but for inspiration of this movie, I'd be looking at the Spielbergs. Uh, um, you know, like Goonies, like um, um, the Raiders, uh, the, where where John Reese Davies was in. Yeah. All the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Indiana Jones. You know, he's a sidekick there. Mm-hmm. And Leano was in, uh, and they're and they're they're fabulous. And a lot of the comedy from the movie comes with, I, I think, I don't know, malfunctioning technology. That's just, uh, that's funny. Like, uh, some, it's it's sort of dark, you know, the robots accidentally <laughs> putting Drano in, in food and uh, zapping all these people and stuff. And that's z- uh, z- assaulting traffic cops and stuff. It's it's pretty funny. It's a, it's a good yeah, I watched that scene. I didn't, that's not part of uh, the original, the, the um we didn't do the Drano. We didn't do the yeah. the uh, the scene that I saw where where he's zapping the traffic cop and setting the uh, the ticket book on fire and all that. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it's it is it's funny stuff. So yeah, both both versions need to come out. Um, well, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Really uh, appreciate you taking uh, time welcome. time to uh, talk to us. You're very welcome. It's, uh, it was great, and, um, and um, I'll get you a copy of the the original Gold Digger. I would love it. We have uh, we have a great theater here called the uh, the Cinema Tech that um, you know just still is all analog, still shows film. I was trying to convince Jack or somebody to come out here, bring bring the uh, the original cut and show it. You know, finally have like a premiere of this thing because it needs to be seen at least somewhere. I think that needs to happen. I, uh, a showing of the that would be wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, so um, find out if you got a two inch. Uh, <laughs> um, if you can do something with the two inch, that would be the best. Yeah, I'll ask about that thing that I have in the in the short term. I'll um, I'll burn a DVD f- off of a VHS, so it's going to be pretty crappy. But uh, it's it sort of adds to it, though. I'm I'm a big fan of the the VHS war- warble and fuzz, so it'll be it'll be just perfect. Thanks a lot. <laughs> You're very welcome. All right. Uh, happy Thanks New Year to you. Thanks for your interest in it. Yeah. Okay. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. That was Mark Richardson, the director of Gold Digger. So that completes part two of our uh, Robot in the Family series. Hopefully part three we can have uh, Joe Panleona on here. Maybe John Reese davies Maybe get him down here for an in-studio you know, and hopefully that'll be leading up to the big premiere of the film at at the Cinematheque. That's that's my dream. I don't think that's too much to ask. Um, getting another call. We got two minutes to fill out. Let's uh see you, see who's on. Hello, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Anybody there? Well, I guess. Whoever was calling didn't want to be on the air. Hey, can I put in one? Yeah, Emery, go ahead. Put in the... Take him out? Yeah, go ahead. We got the Jukebox Willie show coming up in uh, minute 30. That's all, that's all I got. I guess I'll just uh, play some PSAs to fill out the time. Talk at you next week. Keep it locked on... 89.3 WCSB Cleveland.